I want to welcome you guys again to uh, our assembly. This is our 11th week in our co- coronavirus isolation assemblies. Um, maybe our last week, church is beginning to meet and begin to slowly reopen. So hopefully um, we'll be joining them again soon. But as we begin this morning, um, there's a lot on our hearts. And I don't want to fail to miss those things. Obviously, we're coming off of a pandemic. Um, we've had the racial rioting and protests throughout our country over the last few days. Um, I got a text from um, Chad Cagle, the very dear friend of his, Eric Barbie, and his, her, his fiance, um, Christy Calloway, who were killed in a motorcycle accident on Friday. Um, and then um, um, also, of course, um, very close to us here is the tragic loss of Jason Parton at 38 years old, who is found dead on Friday morning. Um, I've known Jason since 2010 when he first came here. He's been a part um, of many of our lives over a long period of time. Um, so as we um, think about that, I wanted to uh, have a special prayer for these things going on. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, we're heartbroken. Um, We're saddened by many tragedies that have come um, to us recently. Father, going through this whole pandemic and the impact of that upon our society, upon our culture, upon our community, um, has certainly had a huge impact. Um, Father, the um, recent um, tragic... um, Death in Minneapolis and the subsequent riots um, continue to show the unrest and the the difficulty, the pain that is in the lives of so many. And Father, we ask for your healing and your comfort and your wholeness and your unity be brought. And Father, I um, think about this couple that was killed on a motorcycle a couple days ago. And Father, we pray for their families and their friends and all those impacted by their loss and pray your comfort and healing upon them. And also for Jason and his family. Father, he's been an important part of our family for 10 years and I know a very significant part of his physical family much longer than that and much more intimately. And Father, we just grieve his loss. We think of his um, girls that will be growing up without their daddy involved in their lives. Um, And Father, for a father who has loved his son for a long time and a lot of people who have um, cared for him and been intimately involved with Jason, Father, we just pray for your comfort. We pray, Father, that as we go to support the family over the next couple days, that even though our presence can in no way take away the pain and the emptiness that they feel, that somehow we can bring a level of support and encouragement and affirmation to them. And that in their loss, they will find hope. In their loss, they will find comfort. In their loss, they'll find purpose and meaning. Father, I pray that you will uh, just guide us through this week. Um, Help us to encourage all those who are impacted by the various tragedies in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, it's amazing to think about. We have had nearly three months, a quarter of the year has been spent as a nation in a level of isolation. Words have been used, isolation, quarantine, social distancing. Um, Kind of reminded me of this um, picture I saw. Um, It mentions you never realize how antisocial you are until there's a pandemic and your life doesn't really change that much. Um, and uh, some of us may relate to that. Um, some of us may have discovered that. But typically these behaviors are forms of human punishment. You think about it, right? The kids misbehaving, we'll put them in time out as a discipline, right? Um, we may even socially shun people, say that we don't want them in our lives for a period of time or involved in our family activities because their behavior is inappropriate and needs to be adjusted or changed. We at times will put people 
in jails and prisons who are not cooperating with, with society um, as a punishment. And even within that, we'll have solitary confinement in which if you really need some punishment, um, you're put there. So this idea of isolation is something we do with unruly children, with those who misbehave, with prisoners of war. Recently, I was reading some about isolation research. They were calling it social recession. That it leads to um, 26% um, increase in premature death. That the short-term impacts are things like the increase in anxiety, depression, suicide, and overdose. Since 2018, there's been a seven-point jump in loneliness index in the U.S. Between 18 and 22-year-olds particularly, it's grown as heavier social media use has increased isolation. In fact, one researcher says that the lack of robust, robust social connections lead to an increased health risk like smoking 15 cigarettes per day or misusing or abusing alcohol. That the health risk of isolation is twice that of obesity. So it just it interests me that we've kind of voluntarily chosen this discipline that also has its negative repercussions. Now, we may be avoiding an illness, and I understand that. At the same time, the consequences of the cure are also severe. There's a couple of things I want to mention. You know, one of the things that we need to understand that's not surprising about this is that it simply reveals to us our createdness. We were created in the image of God. God is a social being. He has... Three persons that he interacts with. And he creates humans to interact with. And so being created in that image, our natural inclination is to interact, to be social. In fact, in Genesis 2.18, after God has done all this creating and says, this is good and this is good and this is good and this is good. And then he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Aloneness is not good for us. In Ecclesiastes 4, in verse 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep, alone, keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three, threefold cord is not quickly broken. So even the, um, Solomon in his wisdom recognizes that companionship, that, that partnership is a critical part of what we need, what's healthy for us. And there's another passage in Hebrews 10. Where it's interesting that as the, while churches voluntarily close their doors based on CDC guidelines and federal and local government guidelines, the scripture's guideline is this. He says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more you see the day um, drawing near. Meeting together is an important part of the Christian experience, certainly in the human experience as well. Being together is critical. And we've gone through a period um, as a society of not doing that for some time. And it's fundamental to the gospel of Jesus Christ, this thing that brings us together. In Ephesians 2, he says that by grace we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, the gift of God, not a result of works that no one can boast. And so we're saved by grace. And as we discussed the other day in class, saved from what? What are we saved from? And he goes on in Ephesians 2 and emphasizes, I think, a really profound idea. It says in Galatians 2 and verse 18, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. In other words, you're no longer separated, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That one of the fundamental things that God's grace does is he takes us from isolation and saves us from that and brings us into community. In fact, the whole context is how um, the break, the, how the, um, the social isolation or the social separation, the racial separations that existed in the time of the scriptures, how it was resolved by Jesus that he brought Jews and Gentiles together and Samaritans and these various ethnic groups and language groups and all these people are brought together in one under Christ. And that that fundamental idea is what we are saved from. We're saved from isolation. We're saved from separation. And we're brought together into community, into a household. We're members of the household of God built on the foundation, the apostles, the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So one of the things that emphasizes that the gospel unites us, the gospel brings us together. I've had many conversations and over the years, now I've been a Christian for over 40 years. Um, most of my really close friends in Christ probably would not have been friends of mine if I had simply used the criteria of the world. They didn't have my interests. They didn't have my hobbies. They didn't have my neighborhood. They didn't have all those things. But what we did find in common was the thing that unites together and has united us together for years more intimately than any relationship, even in familial relationship, our relationship that we have through Christ. This idea of fellowship, this Greek word koinonia, this idea that we share all things commonly is critical to the Christian experience and critical to the human experience. In Acts chapter 2, after the preaching of the gospel, the day of Pentecost comes, which is, by the way, today, today is Pentecost Sunday, as we celebrate the first fruits, as we celebrate the outpouring of God's spirit on that day. As Peter preaches and 3,000 come to faith in Jesus Christ on that one day. It says in verse 42, describe this new gathering. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling the possessions and belongings and distributing the pro proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, the whole picture is that they are brought together in Jesus, that they are together, 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 together is the focus of what happens within the Christian community. And it happens because of one fundamental thing. Last week, we looked through um, Romans 12, um, a number of chapters in Romans 12 or 12, 13, 14 and 15 and 16. But the verse that I skipped over last time, I'll emphasize this time in Romans 12 and verse 3. For the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think himself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That's the thing I want us to hear this morning. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have become members of one another. We are, as a body of Christ, interconnected intimately with each other. I mean, we started this service praying about people's absence from our lives. It's devastating. Losing people that we're close to. It rips away at our very fiber because we are members of each other. That's the nature of what we are and who we are. And so it's critical that we understand this. You know, one of the blessings of his way is that we have the opportunity to bring the gospel of reconciliation to men and their families. There's, I get the privilege over these last 14 years of seeing a lot of healing, a lot of wholeness, a lot of reuniting. Um, it's true for marriages as well. Um, I was doing a lot of um, 
marriage counseling it his way for a while. However, it got kind of overwhelming and it kind of got overscheduled and I felt like I was becoming under effective. So instead of just trying to meet with a lot of individual couples over my week, I thought maybe the best thing to do is maybe I can get them just to meet with each other. The thing just get together. There's probably most of the counseling can be resolved just by that fellowship. Just by that togetherness, just by that members of each other. And so it's been a blessing to watch a lot of couples grow through that and come together. We meet together Thursdays at my house and just, you know, seeing that the bonds, you know, I step back a lot of times and just watch everyone else interacting together and kind of the fellowship and the friendships that are being knit together and the encouragement strength that's coming through that relationship. While much of the world and the church has suffered and is suffering from isolation, we at His Way have remained as a family. We've ran together. And I'm thankful for that. You know, um, as we were isolated in homes, families were kind of clustered together, not interacting with other families. The beauty of our situation is we're clustered together as a family. And so we interact and we stay close with each other. So this morning, I would like for us to share with each other, like I mentioned, I would like y'all to be the sermon this morning. Um, And I gave you a question the other day about how have the relationships and fellowship here contributed to the development of your sobriety? And so this morning, I would just, whoever wants to start, everyone who wants to share something, personal experience, conviction, something you've discovered, um, come on up and share those. Um, and we'll kind of glean from one another this morning. And I'm John, and I'm a one-year graduate here, um, and I live across the street. And um, around the time I was ready to graduate in one year, I um, didn't have the money to leave and graduate. And Tom was like, I think a little bit perplexed by me because I'd get a job, I'd work at it, and I'd get frustrated, and I'd leave. Right, which is kind of our MO because we want to run the company or some of us do, right? And so, and I got a really good job, right? And I went out and bought a Cadillac and all that. And um, I'm, anyway, so some, some of you here know me pretty well. And, um, and I'll, I'll get to the point here in a second. Um, you know, it's not all the stuff, right? The stuff comes and goes and all that. And the relationships you have with people are really the most important things. And as far as isolation, it's like when we get into our cups and our stories and our resentments, our fears and all that, we just start digging, you know, and we don't care how far down we go. We'll just keep digging. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to, you know, I'm, I'm good down here, you know, and, pretty soon we're in total isolation and uh you know so for me it's like the thing that's really helped me this whole time and i'm not perfect and nobody is is to have a relationship with christ that is personal to me right and and then to have fellowship as well and um i think if you have that you're never alone right and oddly enough when i got laid off I would spend a lot of time just um, down at the creek, like swimming in the creek and riding my bike and all that kind of stuff. Um, And then I got this job, Ronnie saw an ad on uh, TV or uh, on the news that they were hiring. I went down and I got hired and um, it's been great. It's been really good. And um, it's, it's, I don't make nearly what I was making, but I have a family over there as well now too. Um, where the job I was at before, it was all about the money and we've got to make production and everything and it's really stressful and, um, you know, just not, not something, you know, if you've got all that stress in your life at a job, it's, I think, you know, first of all, pray about it. Right. Um, but secondly, um, Put your family first. This family here, your family at home. If you don't have a family at work, if that's not, you know, I think I think that's that's part of it too. Um, I mean, you can keep that separate and all, but 
um, it's it's nice to, to be a part of and to and to really ultimately just just be of service and um, so yeah it's glad to be here today thank y'all hello my name's JR I've only been here for five days but relationships have gotten me to this place uh, it's gotten me to start my sobriety uh, without relationships this would not be possible family relationships relationships with the leaders here uh, and uh, I'm just blessed I got a family who has gotten me in here I've got a family here who has allowed me to come here and uh, Without relationships, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to uh, move forward with my sobriety. And uh, relationships is where it's all at because I know I can't do it on my own. Bottom line, in here or outside of here, at work, anywhere I can uh, think of going and trying to be sober. So uh, I'm blessed with relationships from all angles. And uh, I praise God for that. Morning, guys. There's a couple things I want to say first before we got into the question. Um, for one, I know I'm grateful that church is about to start opening up and things like that. And I'm excited to go back, worship with my family and my church family and whatnot. But I will miss this. This has been great. This has been awesome. Um, this is one of the best experiences I've had here. Me and a few guys have been here a lot. I don't know if that's good or bad, but... This has been great. I'm going to miss this when it goes away. And another one, basing, basing on relationships and things like that, I would be, be remiss if I didn't mention something. One of, the, one of my favorite people in the world, Daryl Floyd, celebrated a birthday yesterday. <laughs> and I wanted everybody to know that. So everybody say happy birthday to Daryl. Yeah. Um, God, you know that relationships is the most important part of this to me. Um, when I was sitting in my house going through the worst two weeks of my life before I got in here, relationships is what two relationships I had with two specific men started this whole journey to me. Tom and TJ came and saw me at my house when I was at my lowest point. You know, that's, that's where all this started. And I got to thinking, you know, when I got here and right before what I was missing the most in my life is that I, I didn't have a friend in the world. Nobody, for one, I isolated on purpose, but two, nobody wanted anything to do with me. Uh, you know, I was hurting people left and right. And, and that's, you know, I had nobody, you know, I had a house with a wife and kids and, but I was alone. I was alone. Now, you know, coming, coming through here, you know, my, I, my best friend in the world is coming back. That's probably the best, the best uh, blessing I've gotten so far. Me and my wife, Sarah, is my, my best friend in this entire world. But that's why I came back here. You know, I came back for, for y'all. I came back to get friendships, to rekindle some relationships, to start new ones. There's, we can go to 15, 20 different types of rehabs and whatnot. It doesn't matter what the curriculum here is. It doesn't matter how many Bible tests Tom gives us. It doesn't how many, matter how many classes we go to, how many videos Stuart puts up, you know, how many, uh, how, whatever book we go through, whatever class we go through. None of that really matters in the end. This is what makes this place what this place is. It always has. Is the guys, the residents inside this house. We make this what this is. And that is amazing to me. I've never seen anything like that before. And, you know, an example of that is some of the best recovery I've ever gotten here is sitting up there at the smoke deck. It's not from a class. It's not from a counseling session. It's not from a book. It's getting deep one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a guy in here. You know, that's, I've never been able to see anything like that before. The biggest blessing, you know, aside from my family and whatnot coming in here is I've got guys that I will go to battle with now. I've got guys that look out for me. You know, I've got guys that I want to see really do well. I've got guys that want to see me do well and see me succeed and see us, you know, move forward in this, in this journey. 
You know, you look at even the life of Christ and what he did. He took his select group of boys and set out to change the world. He didn't do it by himself. He chose some people to get close with and to do what he did. I think that's amazing. The residence here is why I came back, bottom line. I've been through 12 steps. I've been through, you know, whatever workbook you want to you wanna throw out here. Y'all are why I came back. And it's reasons for that are why we get so heartbroken when we lose a guy like Jason. You know, I didn't know Jason while he was out there running around. I knew Jason in here. I knew the real Jason, I believe. That's what this place means to me. When you leave, if you leave, everybody's got to leave. That's what you're going to miss. I promise you that. You know, you might not miss Tom's class. You might not miss Daryl's cleanup day. You might not miss movie night on Sunday night. But you're going to miss the guys. And whether it's your roommate or your housemates or who you work with or whatnot. That's what make, it makes this place what it is. So it's up to us, guys. If, if we're going to keep this what this place is falls on us so i love each and every one of you y'all are why i'm here y'all are why i'm still so today and that's amazing no pressure or anything but y'all are why i've, I've made it this far and i appreciate you happy birthday daryl i knew he wasn't gonna say anything so. love y'all guys i'm brian <laughs> um in the uh recognition of the day of pentecost uh, in the Bible, it, uh, it reads, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And that, that's what we are here. And it's really cool, you know, uh, just to just feed off of Tripp's uh, statements and stuff. But then it goes further and says, Suddenly a sound of blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. That's, you know, that's not happening here today. Today's the day of Pentecost. But, or is it happening? You know, um, what does that look like to me? It looked like to us. Um, what they saw seemed to be the tongues of fire. Wow. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. In other tongues, as the Spirit allowed them. Kind of a neat situation we got here um, in this property and in this room and in our gatherings here. I feel the Holy Spirit totally in here. And wow, that's the flames. That's the stuff that, that I can feel in there. And when I read it, I go, hmm, what's that? But to, to be in the presence of it and be in the presence of all of you as we're all together here. And day of Pentecost is a blessing. Hello, fellas. Um, my name is Ronnie. The blessing that I have from each and every one of y'all is that y'all are wanting to change your life. Um, and when I got here this time, my sole purpose is to change my life. I've told y'all before, I've got three men that are on my team that I look up to every day and I do not make choices without talking to at least one or two of them three people. Um, every time I sit out there on that smoking court and I listen and I get to know y'all. There is, how can I say this? No. There's lots of things that I wish that I had that some of y'all have. There's lots of things I'm glad I don't have what you have. <laughs> um, my my process going through this is to release and get rid of all the negativity in my life. Um, Daryl and Tom know how I felt, how I feel about my daughter. And through years 
of me coming through here, I would not release that. I, I, I wanted that control. That's my baby. This time around, I let her go. And when I let her go is when I found peace. Is when I had that control. I realized if I could release that control, that my life would be, our relationship would be a lot better. And it's the best it's been since she was probably 14 years old. Um, I do not want to see any one of y'all go through what Jason had to go through. It is a, I've been here long enough to realize that it's going to happen. And I hate it. I hate it with all the passion. I just can't, I just, I can't deal with it. But I know what to do with it now. I hand it over to God and I keep moving on. Um, one of the biggest things that keeps me sober is watching that man back there, Doug Stockner. I've grown up with that man since I was seven years old. And we've been through a lot together. And I'm very proud of you, Doug. Um, I knew his whole family. So I just want to say to each and every one of y'all, please, whatever you do, find what you have to find here. And do what you have to do because burying one of y'all or even burying me is not what this what what we want to happen. We want to see successful lives and families put back together. I just want to say thank you for each and every one of y'all because the good and the bad is what makes me grow. Appreciate it. I'm Sean. Uh, I just wanted to come up here and tell y'all thank you because since I've been here, I've probably experienced one of the most significant losses that I'll ever experience in my life. And I've gone through this before with my parents, uh, my granddaddy, but I've never experienced comfort like each and every one of y'all provided me. And I appreciate that. Um, you know, I've had those of y'all that have came to me when I was having an off day or, you know, it might have seemed like I wasn't where I needed to be. And I appreciate that, too, because sometimes I need that eye opener. You know, if it weren't for y'all, honestly, like Tripp said, I probably still wouldn't be here. Honestly. This place... It gave me something that uh, most people hadn't gave me. Like, alcohol, drugs, they, they cloud your judgment. You know, you make mistakes out there. And, you know, you'll lose relationships. You know, you break trust, you lose hope. And what do you do? You go back to drugs and alcohol. But this place, you know, they can help you change the way you think. They can help. They can help you so much, but the one thing I feel like they've done the most for me is they've gave me the trust and the hope back to me. Because, I mean, I can have the ability to do something in my life, but if everybody I've done wrong don't give me no trust and don't got no hope in me, then where does that leave me? You know, and if they just, this place right here, they open their arms and they gave me trust and hope, you know? So, I mean, the sky's the limit, you know? I mean, you can do whatever you want. All you gotta do is stay sober. And I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you, Tom. Hi, I'm Walter. How's everybody doing today? Good, I hope. Uh, yes, isolation, I'm sure as y'all can tell, I'm the quiet one. Uh, you know, I'm big into isolation. I don't know, it's just my natural go-to uh, people have always perplexed me just a little bit, but you know being here with you guys You know, I'm starting to get some of to know you some of you guys and like I could talk to you, you know, and that's a good thing for me, you know but In my life, I you know before all this 
you know, negativity happened to me, I had purpose. You know, I had you know, a family, a place of my own, you know, a job, responsibility, and I had purpose in my life. You know, and I found in my life that with purpose comes motivation, comes drive, comes the ability to actually put, you know, put your feet down on the ground and do what you got to do, you know, and actually be productive. And in the past year and a half, I, I lost my sense of purpose. I lost my, my reason for being a person, you know, to, you know, get up in the morning, to go to work, to uh, want to socialize with people, you know, never really was good at that, but... Uh, you know, and coming back here and seeing guys with purpose, seeing them getting their life back, you know, their families, their jobs, their, you know, getting to actually be a person again. You know, I, I had lost all of that and I'm starting to get that back now, which is the, the God blessed American thing that I needed it was purpose. And, uh, you know, with that, I share. Hey, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, yeah, I think one of the, uh, my, my biggest thing, I mean, it's been critical to me is the relationships you have here. Not just with staff, but just with the other guys. I mean, the, uh, you know, for me personally, I mean, I could tend to be, you know, have 10 different good twins in a day, and, you know, everybody's been pretty understanding about that. You know, I know from high to low to mid to, you know, but I, I came in with a group of guys that, and most of them are still here, that all understand that. It's been critical. Because like everybody else, I'll tend to isolate. Uh, I can get crazy from my own head. And, uh, you know, that's the one thing that I'm really thankful for here is the group of guys and, and staff members that I've, that's been around me that kind of understand that and kind of talk to me, kind of talk me out of my, uh, whether it be depression or, you know, being almost manic about things. But uh, that's been critical for me. And uh, I'm really thankful for that. So, thank y'all. Hey, guys. I'm Jacob. I hate getting up. <laughs> 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 uh, I do want to say to everybody that I, I you know, I appreciate the relationships too. Uh, one thing I never really had in my life, I'm isolated really bad, you know. Uh, so being here and being able to develop those has, has meant something to me I can't even really explain. Um, just having friends, you know, I, I can't remember. It's been since like junior high school that I had friends, you know. So. I appreciate that, and I also appreciate that everybody here is something you don't find in uh, when, when you leave this place near as much as everybody here is real open about the things they struggle with, and uh, also very interested in uh, wanting to better their life. You know, I realize that whenever I leave, go out to work, and things like that, that that's just not the norm. You know, in the world, most people are coasting along because they don't really have problems. You know. Not to the extent that we have. So I appreciate everybody here for being open and uh, us growing together. Thanks. Thank you. One I've, I've learned a lot, and, 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 and coming in at 63 years old, and, and, and most of them quite a bit younger than me, uh, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a great experience. I, I, I think I've bonded with a lot of the younger guys, just about everybody, and that is, that is really good. That's really good. Uh, just a few things I want to talk about what I've learned and, 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 and observed and, and bettered myself for it. Just uh, how, Dar uh, I'll just mention a few, Daryl Floyd, Doug, you, Tom. Uh, how to carry yourself, you know, how to, how to be a godly man. I've learned, I've learned by watching while I've been here. Uh, Jeremy Mitchell, you know, uh, uh, learned uh, a good work ethic from uh, Jackie Parkes. I mean, he, he, he's here every morning at 4.30. Uh, I don't know exactly what time, 4.30 or so. And then he works at Olive Garden, but he's always got a great attitude, you know. And, and that's what I try to, that's try, I try to follow that. And, uh, some other stuff I've learned from residents is uh, one of the best roommates you could ever have, Jeremy Ballantyne, learned how to hug, you know, give hugs and, 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 and just uh, a good person. Uh, look forward to uh, every morning coming down and talking to Brian, you know, during the week, every morning, getting coffee and cutting up. 
Miranda Wilkes, uh, one of our former residents, I, I learned real quick, uh, he's a no-nonsense, don't kid around. So, so he checked me on that before, and, uh, and that was good. Well, Randall. Um, uh, and one of, the, one of the craziest things, Trip, uh, you know, probably the first couple of months you were here, you know, we hardly ever talked. Now we talk every day. How's your day? And, and it's, it's a funny thing when, it, when, when you, you and I usually get together and talk, it's something about the Bible or something, something pretty serious. It's really not any kidding around. And I, I appreciate that relationship. Chris, you know, every day I ask you if you sold something. You know, every day when you come in. So, uh, you know, and uh, Todd, Todd. When you first came in, you, you talked about it in your interview. Uh, you know, you, you were, you, you didn't like to speak and, and everything. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but, but uh, one of the days after class, uh, I told you, you know, I, I really appreciate what, you, what you're talking about. I, I like listening to you talk. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, and being able to watch you come out of your shell type deal is really, Really, really good. So, uh, just uh, learned a lot, and I learned that we all have a common denominator: uh, our addiction and our drinking problem. But uh, one thing we can definitely get out of this place is have God on our side. And you know, you hear about unconditional love. Will Turner came in one day from past and had just the the nicest, best shirts, the dry cleaned, uh, just all kinds of really, really nice clothes. And I didn't ask him, but he just brought them to me. And, and, and I've saved one that's still dry cleaned for graduation. And, and that just shows the love that, that these guys do for each other, even you know, without asking. And thank you. Good afternoon. I want y'all to know I'm the real big Ronnie. So just to let, to let you know. So, had to let y'all know that real quick. Because the other one tries to tell me he is all the time. All right, I just want you guys to realize that you got to realize why you're here. You got to know why you're here and what you're doing. Okay? And, you know, and when you take out of this place and where you go, you know, since I graduated, you got to let them know where you came from. You know, don't ever be ashamed of what we go through here. Because once you tell people your path, they will join in with you. You know, when you're talking about your relationships, you know, my work knows where I've been. They love me. There's nothing ashamed about what we're doing. You've got to start taking pride in what you are. And your relationships that you build outside of here and in here, okay? Because every week I keep myself accountable. I call Philip Gibson. I call Jermaine Stone. And I call Michael French. And we talk. And, you know, and no matter what anybody's going through, you should always be there for them. Because that's what we're here. We're a brotherhood here. Okay, and that's what you learn here. We're all here for each other. And my biggest point that I've learned from here is serve and love everybody, no matter what. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm James. I'm a former year graduate and employee. Um, and my pride and embarrassment tried to hold me back from coming back. Uh, but the relationships I built the first time here is what ultimately won out. Uh, I remember coming up and first person I saw was Jackie, who was coming into the program when I was here last time. Uh, and he hugged me and what he said to me was, you sitting down listening to me did a whole lot for me. Uh, and then I saw Nick and he gave me a hug too and he still had a bracelet on I had given him four years ago. Uh, so that, thank God that worn out over my own selfish pride and, and, and embarrassment. Uh, and that's all I think. I saw Dana and he hugged me. I saw Daryl, he hugged me. I saw Tom and he hugged me. Uh, and that made everything okay. Uh, and so that's what brought me back was the relationships I'd formed here the first time. Uh, and I'm still doing that. And that's what's keeping me sober by the grace of God. Because he's using y'all. Uh, to help keep me sober. And I hope he's using me to help keep y'all sober. Uh, 
And I know one thing I've learned last time and this time is we're all examples to one another. It's a good example or a bad example. It's our choice of what we choose to be. Uh, you know, we can be salt that enhances or we can be salt that gets walked upon. And, you know, the death of Jason's kind of eat me up. And uh, I, with all due respect, I don't want to be that kind of example. All right, so apparently Tripp's going to hold me in contempt if I don't talk, so uh, I'm Zach. Um, one thing I can say that this place has done for me as far as friendships is I used to have a, a brother that I fell out with, and um, this place has provided um, a way for that to work itself out, and we are now brothers again. Um, I love you to death. And uh, I don't know if people know what was going on, but um, it was a big issue for me, real big. I love you, and I appreciate all y'all. Hey guys, I'm Stuart. You know, the oldest written account of the life of Jesus that we know about is the book of Mark. And he opens that writing by stating, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the anointed one. This word gospel is one we hear a lot and often it's translated good news. But this is not the word just like, hey, good news, you got the job. It's not that kind of good news. In the Greek, in the Roman world, this word euangelion, which is used, means a royal proclamation. It's the kind of news that's worthy of finding a herald to go run around the entire country stating the king is coming. This is big news. And that's what Mark is writing about here. It's what all the gospels are writing. And that's also what Jesus is proclaiming. The very first words that Mark records there in chapter one that Jesus ever says in his writing is this, he says, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in this good news. The king is coming. And the rest of the recorded accounts in Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, all of them are about the outbreak of this kingdom. And what kind of king is going to rule over that kingdom? The powerful kingdoms in mankind's history are won and ruled by force. Where subjects work for and are serving a king to bring that person wealth and honor. And at this point in history, it is the Roman Empire, which is occupying the land of Israel. Actually, they're occupying pretty much the whole world. They extort from those that they subjugate, they violently squash any one who resists. If you lived in Jerusalem during this time, it would not be uncommon to see a mass crucifixion of those who had rebelled. Some of your cousins were probably part of a faction that are trying to overthrow parts of the government. And they were round up and they were crucified, hung on a cross. That's just how kingdoms work, right? That's, that's Rome being a good kingdom. But Jesus' good news is of a kingdom that's quite different. It's a kingdom characterized by giving to those in need. By extending grace and mercy to others, even to the point of praying for and loving our enemies. That's not the way kingdoms usually operate. That recognizing we are all created in the image of God with inherent value, making us all worthy of respect. His kingdom is unlike any the world had ever known or will ever know. He says it very clearly when he's on trial before the Roman authorities near the end of his life. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not like any man could ever conceive nor could ever create. Jesus didn't just speak about his kingdom. He lived it out in the way he treated others. And guys, if you have nothing else that you get out of being in the Bible, read those accounts. 
See who this man is, Jesus, and how he treated others and how different he really is. And then in the events of his final days that we're about to commemorate here, he showed that he stepped into the misery and suffering of mankind in a way that no king would ever do. And he is saying, I'm here with you in your pain. I know what this feels like. I know what it feels like to be humiliated, to be betrayed by your closest friends, to be rejected. He was called crazy by his own family. And he says, I offer you a different way forward, a different way to live. And what did he get in return? He received his crown, right? A crown of thorns causing him to bleed profusely. He receives a robe covering his body that had been beaten. He is ascending his throne as he goes on to the cross. Even the sign that was nailed on his cross says he is the king of the Jews. He is receiving his kingdom in the most grotesque way you could imagine because his kingdom is so different. And he proves there is real power in his kingdom by overcoming death, by walking out of the tomb. That's why the Apostle Paul would later write, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. That is the power behind all that the kingdom is about. If you want to go ahead and open up your packet here, we're going to take it all at once here just in a moment. When we eat this bread and we drink this cup, I want to be very clear, we are not only affirming that we believe the events of Jesus' life took place. We are pledging allegiance to a king. Although this ceremony is quite commonplace, this is treason against our own way of doing things about what our hearts and our minds and our bodies desire. We want to be king, right? And when we're honest with ourselves and when we take a close look, we realize I am not up to that task. I am in desperate need of the creator of the universe to be in control. Our only hope, the only truth is that Jesus is Lord and King. Let's pray and then we'll take both of these together. Lord, as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we admit we make a mess of our own lives and we are in need of the power which only comes through your crucifixion and resurrection and the Holy Spirit which you offer. We give you our allegiance and recognize you as our King. Hail King Jesus. Amen.